As you heard, we have uh, others here tonight, uh, including my partner in all this, John Brady. And, uh, and, and so John will talk some more about some of the specific research opportunities and what has, in fact, been a fantastic year. Uh, before that, though, I do want to thank uh, the, the, the chapter for hosting this event, all of you for coming out. Uh, and, uh, and, and really, I, I want you to know that there is this important staff volunteer partnership. That's one of the cornerstones of JDRF uh, since the earliest days of the organization. And uh, we, we have a very active volunteer uh, base throughout the country. And, uh, and, and I am a beneficiary of that because I, I learn from and, uh, and, and, and receive counsel uh, from the different volunteers all around the country. But my closest partner is the guy you'll hear from now, and he's John Brady, and uh, a fantastic chair for us all. And we're very fortunate to have him. So thank you. I am John Brady. I'm uh, chairman of the International Board. And uh, I took a bio break at the wrong time a year ago, December, and, and that's what happened. Uh, so my term started. Uh, uh, July 1st, and I had this wonderful vice chair uh, for three weeks, Derek Rapp, and he is uh, now my staff partner, and I couldn't be uh, happier or more proud to have Derek at the helm of this organization. We are in very, very good hands and will be for some time to come, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to work with him. Uh, the date of uh, my son's diagnosis uh, was uh, June 8th of 1992. Uh, unlike most of you who had a diagnosis in the family and came immediately to JDRF, um, I wasn't one of those. We fell through the cracks. Uh, I don't know whether we just weren't sufficiently philanthropic. My wife was trying to keep Philip safe and healthy, not neglect the other two. I was building a business and traveling. But uh, um, what brought me here uh, to JDRF and what brings me uh, here tonight is um, is the advancements in stem cell research. I live in Washington, D.C., though I spent five and a half wonderful years in Boston. Um, like I said earlier, my, my wife is from Memphis, so if I had my way, I'd live here, but since she's from Memphis, we compromised and live in D.C. Uh, but what brought me to, to, to JDRF was the, the, the policy battle in uh, 2001 over uh, federal funding of embryonic stem cell research, which was, uh, to me, a, a game-changing issue and a field of research that ha um, held enormous, uh, enormous promise. And so we are here tonight to talk about the tangible um, results of, of that battle that uh, JDRF fought and led, and a lot of your money and others' money going into some world-class research, uh, which is, is really best, I would say, encapsulized um, in the individual from whom we will hear tonight. Uh, as Derek said, the last 12 months have been really extraordinary in terms of research progress across our portfolio. Um, but what we shouldn't lose sight of is that JDRF has been at this for 45 years, and we have invested uh, about $2 billion of, of your money. And while we have achieved um, great success in the, in the uh, previous 12 months, it's really been 45 years of committed, passionate parents, loved ones, and philanthropic individuals getting us here. So we really are riding, standing on the shoulders who, of those who came before us, and we're greatly um, appreciative uh, of their efforts. So I'd like to very quickly take you through just a few items that um, uh, have occurred in the last 12 months. In fact, I think I, I was here, um, as I said uh, uh, to someone earlier, I was, last time I was here, it was quite cold. And they said, well, it's cold tonight. And I said, no, it was really cold when I was up here. <laughs> so it was roughly 12, 13, 14 months ago. And the things I'm going to talk about now, I didn't talk about tonight because they hadn't happened. Uh, as Derek mentioned, you know, we still remain passionate about finding the cure, the restoration of normal physiology for those who have this terrible disease. The reality is it's complicated. We don't know how to get there, and it's going to take longer than any of us want. So what we can do is, is relieve the burden, improve the outcomes, and make this an easily managed chronic disease 
uh, that, uh, again, has very, very low burden and great outcomes. And we can do that. We have business plans and roadmaps and timelines and costs associated with some prioritized therapies. The first uh, of those prioritized therapies is the repurposing of type 2 drugs for use in making uh, uh, the control of uh, glucose and type 1s much better. Uh, we've known for some time, had uh, a modest amount of evidence that the use of certain type 2 drugs by individuals who have type 1 could in fact dramatically alter their, uh, uh, their glucose control. My son Philip takes a drug called Invokana. Uh, many of you have probably seen it advertised on TV. He takes a pill a day. It's approved for type 2. He's using it off-label, obviously. So he takes a pill a day, and uh, what Invokana does, it's called an SGLT2 inhibitor, and uh, SGLT2 is a protein that allows the kidneys to reabsorb excess glucose. And uh, in healthy individuals, that's a good thing. But in somebody with type 1 diabetes, if you think about it and say, well, what instead of, instead of having the body reabsorb that excess glucose, what if it just were to pass through the kidneys and out in the urine and not stay in the body? And so these SGLT2 inhibitors, of which Invokana is one, inhibits the action of this protein SGLT2 that allows the kidneys to reabsorb the glucose. Philip takes a pill a day wears a Dexcom continuous monitor. And now that he's on Invokana, you see him go up. Uh, he started eating uh, God, bagels with uh, egg, cheese, and sausage bagels, which he, after he started taking Invokana, fortunately, he's quit that. But for the first couple of weeks, he sort of celebrated with a big breakfast sandwich. And you would see his postprandial, post-meal spike heading up as one would expect. When he gets to about 175 or 180, what you see is it just plateaus out as the excess glucose is, is just eliminated through the urine, and then he comes back down. So it handles the highs, makes handling the highs much easier. The second thing it does is, is that it reduces his usage of insulin. So he uses about 30% less insulin than he did before he started in Vokana. So when he's starting to come down from that postprandial spike, he's got less insulin on board, so he has fewer lows. And he's lost about 20 pounds. So fewer highs, fewer lows because he's on less insulin and weight loss. So what JDRF began a few years ago, and this is one that didn't take 45 years to accomplish, is we looked at it and said, you know, there's no other organization that is trying to understand the impact of these drugs across the entire type 1 universe, figure out are there different subgroups within that universe that need different therapies or different dosage or combination therapies. And we started funding clinical trials. We've gotten the, the companies who fund type 2, who, who have these type 2 drugs to start to engage in type 1 trials. And we're seeing some very, very exciting data um, in, uh, from these, these trials. So um, going forward, we hope in three, four, five years, uh, that uh, the use of type 2 drugs in helping to manage type 1 will be part of the standards of care and just the routine part of, of the way we all live. So that's pretty exciting. The second thing that's very exciting is the artificial pancreas devices um, that are coming to market. We, they, our work in artificial pancreas goes back to 2005. And uh, this January, Medtronic, uh, most of you are familiar with Medtronic, many of you are customers of Medtronic. Medtronic announced, uh, uh, made two important announcements. Uh, the first uh, thing they announced was that a year from this April, uh, they expect to ship in the United States what is called a predictive low glucose management system. So what happens is it looks 30 minutes ahead. If it sees that you're going below a threshold, unless you override it, it eliminates the infusion of insulin. What the clinical trials show is unless you bolus very heavily and don't eat, if you wear this device, dangerous low blood glucose levels are a thing of the past. It'll be commercially available here in about 14 months. The more exciting announcement to me, and that, the first one is a big deal. Everybody goes to sleep, everybody wakes up. Uh, that's a big deal. But the second one is particularly exciting is they expect to ship the first true artificial pancreas in April of 2017, so roughly 26 months from now. 
you'll be able in the United States before anywhere else in the world as a result of many people's efforts, but specifically JDRF's, to get a hybrid closed loop system that not just controls the lows as we talked about, but looks 30 minutes out, sees if you're going high, and if you are, it infuses enough insulin to bring you down back in range. And essentially all you have to do is bolus for meals. Uh, and the early, the, the clinical data on these are also very, very compelling. So that's a life-changing device that is now, for the first time, we have from a, a reputable manufacturer a specific ship date um, that we all hope they will hit. Um, so that's pretty exciting. The third thing uh, that has happened, and many of you have heard about this, the company was based in Beverly, Mass, Smart Cells. Probably many of you have heard Todd, uh, Todd Zion that uh, uh, came up with a concept. You, know, you can engineer insulins to, to act in different ways. And Todd's concept was that you could do what's uh, engineer a glucose responsive insulin that would act when there was excess glucose in the system and then um, um, not act when you were in euglycemia. Uh, he had wonderful, uh, developed a wonderful first version of that, generated literally perfect blood sugars in, um, in rodents, but, but had some safety concerns uh, for use in humans. Merck bought the company, re-engineered the insulin, and um, uh, in Q2 of 2014, the CEO of Merck announced that they were headed into human clinical trials. They are now in human clinical trials, which is very exciting. What's even more exciting is Novo Nordisk. Um, CEO told Derek at the, uh, uh, what was it, the which, Death Valley Ride, Death Valley ride that uh, the glucose responsive insulin program that they had spent a lot of money on and had shelved is now off the shelf, and they've dusted it off and are aggressively investing to uh, develop um, also a glucose responsive insulin. And as you would expect, the other major players in the insulin field and some pharma companies who are not in the insulin field um, are, have, have come to us and asked for our help in connecting them with um, scientists who can help them generate a smart insulin. My son says, you know, you give me my Dexcom monitor and a shot a day, that's not a cure, but that's pretty good. Um, and I think we would all agree with that. He said he was good to go, actually, was, his, uh, was the term. And then the fourth thing, which really, to me, is, is the true bridge to the cure, and that's uh, repl um, encapsulated replacement cells. You know, if you think about it, we take type 2 drugs, get those into people and improving lives. We get artificial pancreas devices on market. We get a shot a day or maybe two shots a day of really smart insulin that does a better job. That's the bridge to encapsulation. Uh, a company in California uh, called Viacite is now in human clinical trials. Uh, four people have the device. They may go into another two in the first cohort of research. After that, they're going into 36 more. So we do have a first generation encapsulation device. Um, actually, right here is one. Uh, obviously no cells in it, but there are four individuals walking around with this first generation device. Um, it's complicated, it's research, the chances are they're going to have to tweak things, but we actually have them in humans. That's very exciting. So that's what the four things that we're planning, that we are doing for those who suffer from the disease today. Then the next thing we have to do is prevent it for those who um, don't have it. There's two ways to prevent it. The first is what's called primary prevention, which is really what we'd like, which is a universal uh, vaccine or therapy that prevents the autoimmune attack from ever starting. Um, that's ideal. The problem is it's really complicated. We don't fully understand how the disease starts, and we don't have a roadmap for preventing it. So that's, that's also probably some time away. But what we do understand, and we have uh, a, a bunch of research uh, that we're funding, and, and we're in some pretty interesting clinical trials, is we, we believe we have a pr very good understanding of how to stop the autoimmune attack after it starts, but while you still have enough residual beta cell mass to remain insulin independent. That's called secondary prevention. So uh, in, our, in our plans is uh, the aspirational yet achievable goal that we, we 
are setting for ourselves is that we will have proof of concept in humans five to seven years from now that we can delay the onset of insulin, of insulin dependence uh, with somebody who, where the autoimmune attack has started for at least five years. Uh, somebody said, well, can you delay it 10? I said, wait a minute, this, we're talking about a five to seven year trial. So we don't know how long we'll be able to, to extend that insulin independence, but we do think in five to seven years we'll have definitive proof of concept that we can do that. That means commercialization probably in another seven to 10 years. So you can expect reasonably 15 years from now, those who are at risk can go get, uh, um, if you're my wife, uh, you take the siblings or grandkids down to the doctor every week, probably more prudent to do it every quarter. Um, <laughs> but you can go see if the autoimmune attack has started. If they find the antibodies, you take this combination therapy and they have type one but never become uh, insulin dependent. So, you know, those, all of those things have happened in the last 12 months. Just tremendously, tremendously exciting research. What we're doing as an international board under Derek's leadership um, and our collaboration is we're in the process of re-engineering JDRF to be the kind of business it needs to be, the kind of organization it needs to be to bring the necessary money, the necessary scientific talent, the business talent, and the volunteers for advocacy and fundraising purposes to the table to take all of these therapies to the finish line. So it's an exciting time to be at JDRF. Uh, it's an exciting time to be here in Boston because you do have one of the most renowned uh, researchers in the world and somebody who has been a true inspiration uh, to me. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, I believe after, um, after Doug speaks, uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you.